Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. And Then There Were None. By Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie's Murder Mystery and Then There Were None was published in 1939 and is one of her most well-known works. The book is often regarded as Christie's greatest work and praised by critics of the time for its ingenuity and spine-tingling effect. Numerous adaptations of the book have been produced throughout the years, including stage productions as well as movies, radio dramas, computer games, and television shows. To this day, many people consider it a classic piece of writing. A group of strangers is invited to an island off the coast of England, and the plot revolves around them. Eight people received a letter from a friend or family member urging them to come to an Indian island for a variety of reasons. Every single one of them, whether they're hoping for a quiet vacation or finding a new job, is completely unprepared for what lies ahead. Soon after arrival, the party is gathered in the drawing room when a recorded voice accuses each participant of a previously unsolved murder. Denialism abounds, but when the guests begin inexplicably dying one by one, the truth of the video and the retribution they will undoubtedly face become apparent. In order to uncover the riddle of who is picking them off without getting killed in the process, the gang of strangers has no way to leave the island and no clear suspects to investigate. On a train to the beach village of Sticklehaven, England, the novel begins. All eight people are presented in the opening chapter, and they all have their unique motivations for visiting Indian Island. It has been requested that each of the characters come to the island by letter. These are the people we're dealing with. In a letter from an old acquaintance named Constance Calmington, Justice Wargrave, a newly retired judge, was invited to spend some time on the island for a vacation. An employee of the island owner's wife, Eun and Nancy Owen, Vera Claythorne was hired as a secretary. Having recently lost a loved one to drowning, Vera was reluctant to accept the position and travel to the island. We know she was present at the time of the victim's death and has been exonerated of all charges, but we don't know who the victim is. There is a man named Philip Lombard, who claims to be employed on Indian Island, but we don't know what he does there or how much money he makes there. There is a strong implication that Lombard may be involved in some sort of illicit activity. Traveling to Indian Island for a vacation is Emily Brent, a conservative and religious woman. She just got a letter from an anonymous individual claiming to have once lived at the same guest house as her, but offering no more details. Despite this, the signature is illegible on the letter. It didn't deter Emily Brent from going on the vacation. It is reported that a man by the name of General MacArthur is transferring to a slower train due to issues with his ticket. Friends from his past had invited him to the island to visit him. The general is grateful for the invitation, as he fears that his friends have shunned him because of an old rumor. The rumor hasn't been revealed to us. Dr. Armstrong is driving to Sticklehaven instead of utilizing public transportation. He's been requested to go to the island to check on Mrs. Owen, whose health is in jeopardy. While driving, he remembers on an accident that nearly ended his professional career several years ago, when he was still drinking frequently. His car gets passed by Tony Marston, who is traveling at a dangerously high rate of speed. Mr. Bloor, the last character introduced in the chapter, is sifting through a list of all the characters that have been introduced thus far. They are all going to Indian Island, and he's going there himself for an unspecified work, but he's aware of it. He claims that it will be a piece of cake. This man warns him that there is a storm brewing over the island, which means that his day of reckoning is drawing nigh. Just like the elderly guy, Bloor thinks he is closer to God's wrath than anyone else. All of the characters who were traveling by train have arrived at Sticklehaven and are waiting for taxis to take them to the pier at the beginning of Chapter 2. There is a sense of excitement among the visitors as they learn that they are all traveling to Indian Island, a destination that none of them have visited before. To get the group to the island, a boat captain by the name of Fred Narricott will be arriving soon. Inside, he wonders why Mr. Owen, the billionaire he believes to be the owner of the island, would host such an eccentric collection of strangers. The guests are greeted by the butler, Mr. Rogers, and his wife, Mrs. Rogers, at the front door of the big estate when they arrive on the island. That their host is delayed, but their rooms have been prepared, and they are welcome to make themselves at home. To prepare for the night, each member of the group goes to their respective room. Ten Little Indians is a nursery tale Vera remembers from her youth, and she spots a needle point on the wall of her room that translates it. During the course of the rhyme, Ten young Indian children are tragically slain in various workplace accidents. There is only one Indian boy left at the end of the rhyme. And then there were none, concludes the rhyme after he hangs himself. Justice Wargrave is quickly recognized as he walks by Dr. Armstrong later in the evening. 
He recalls testifying in Wargrave's courtroom on a number of occasions. Asked about Constance Calmington, Wargrave is bewildered when Armstrong informs him he has never heard of her. MacArthur says he regrets attending and wishes he could go as the guests get ready for supper at the end of the chapter. Because the Fred Narricott's boat has already departed and won't return for a few days, he recognizes that it's impossible for him to do so. The guests are shortly summoned to dinner and discover a ten-piece porcelain set of Indian figurines in the center of the table. Vera points out that the rhyme on the wall of her room is a perfect match. When everyone has finished eating, they go to the drawing room for a drink. A disembodied, recorded voice suddenly interrupts the commotion in the room and begins speaking over it. Everyone in the room has been accused of a murder that occurred in the past, but no one knows where the voice is coming from or who it is accusing. In an emotionless mechanical tone, the voice provides specifics on each homicide. Just as the voice began, it abruptly halts after listing each defendant and their victim. With each person claiming their innocence and launching into rage, the room erupts into a chorus of denial. The search for the source of the voice is on, and Philip Lombard is soon rewarded with the discovery of an antique record player in the adjacent room. Although he had been instructed to do so by his boss, Rogers, the butler, admitted that he had no idea what it would play when he was prompted to switch it on. The words swan song are inscribed on the disc. Once again, everyone congregates in the drawing room, and they press Mr. Rogers to admit that he and his wife have never met their boss, Mr. Owen. An agency hired him and sent him instructions via snail mail, according to the man. Justice Wargrave takes charge of the situation and wants everyone to explain why they were on the island. There is little doubt in the minds of those in the group that Mr. Owen has taken on the personas of various friends and old acquaintances in order to bring them all together. Wargrave points out that the recording mentions a Mr. Plore, but no one in their group goes by that name. A private investigator engaged to guard the jewels of Mrs. Yuan. Owen comes forward to reveal that the name Mr. Davis they were given was phony, and that Mr. Bloor was the one who gave them the name Mr. As Wargrave points out, the name U.N. Owen has the ring of unknown, suggesting that they were brought together by a psychopath bent on murder. Everyone in the group is prepared to fight back against the accusations that have been leveled against them. Wargrave, who was charged with the murder of Edward Seaton, claims that Seaton was little more than a suspect in his own case. In the case of the death of Cyril Hamilton, Vera has been accused of the crime, although she insists that she was merely acting as his governess. She tried her hardest to save him, but he perished in the ocean. Despite the fact that General MacArthur was suspected of the murder of Arthur Richmond, the lover of his wife, he maintains that Richmond died in the line of duty while on a reconnaissance mission with one of his own squad members. He denies that his wife ever had an affair with another man. Philip Lombard claims that the murder of 21 members of an African tribe, for which he was accused, was exaggerated by the prosecution. They were left in the wilderness by him, but it was simply to save himself. Accused murderer James Landor was Mr. Bloor. When he was a police officer, he testified against Landor, but Landor only died in prison. Despite the fact that he was accused of killing a patient named Louisa Mary Cleese, Dr. Armstrong denies ever knowing her. However, in private, he confirms that he is aware of the incident. Only Tony Marston is willing to admit that he committed the offense. With a casual admission, the accused confesses to accidentally running over two children called John and Lucy Coombs. They were accused with the murder of Jennifer Brady, an elderly, ill woman who had worked for them as a housekeeper. They received some money following their mother's death, but they had no involvement in it. Emily Brent is the only one who refuses to respond to the accusations against her. In the end, Wargrave advises that the gang stop participating in this little farce and leave the next morning as soon as the boat returns. Except for Tony Marston, who suggests they stay and try to figure out who UN Owen really is, everyone else agrees. He chokes on a drink while he was speaking and died instantly. Because Marston poured the drink himself, the other guests can only believe that he took his own life by poisoning himself. Upon arrival at Marston's bedroom, his body is covered with a sheet. It's been determined that since it's getting late, everyone should retire to their rooms and secure the doors. When Fred Narricott is called, the party expects they can leave the following morning. Mr. Rogers is the only one who stays up to clean up after the meal. On the table, he finds one of the ten small Indian sculptures missing. They can only contemplate the veracity of the charges brought against them while listening to the sound of the water lapping against the rocks outside their windows, alone in their chambers. There's something special about the day Cyril died that Vera remembers, and especially the knowledge she had about the future of their family's money after he was gone. 
Philip Marston's death and the first verse of Ten Little Indians are very similar to one another. One choked his little self and suddenly there were nine is how the first verse begins. During the middle of the night, Mr. Rogers awakens Dr. Armstrong from a nightmare in which the patient on his operating table must be killed by himself or another person. Once he'd finished cleaning up and retired to his bed, Mr. Rogers noticed he couldn't wake his wife from her slumber. He went to the doctor to express his concern. Dr. Armstrong discovers that Mrs. Rogers died of an overdose while she was sleeping. Before breakfast, people get up and head to the wharf in anticipation of seeing the boat return. However, they become concerned if it does not arrive on time. Later, Dr. Armstrong notifies the group of Mrs. Rogers' death. One of the most famous lines from a poem called Ten Little Indians is Nine Little Indian Boys Sat Up Very Late, One Overslept Himself and Then There Were Eight. This is something Vera can't help but think about as she lies dying. In the center of the table, Mr. Rogers is appalled to see only eight Indian figures. Emily Brent and Vera Claythorne go for a walk on the estate's neighboring cliffs later that day. Vera is told by Emily that Mrs. Rogers committed suicide because of a guilty conscience. As part of her account, she tells Vera about her charge. For years, Emily had been suspected with the murder of Beatrice Taylor, a young maid who had previously worked for the woman. Apparently, Emily had a maid named Beatrice Taylor who worked for her, and when the young woman became pregnant, Emily promptly fired her. Beatrice took her own life soon after. It is Emily's contention that she has no guilt over this. There is a high probability of two suicides occurring within a 12-hour period in the same residence, therefore Lombard and Dr. Armstrong conclude that Mrs. Rogers did not kill herself. When Armstrong tells Lombard about the disappearance of the Indian figures, they both observe how the first two verses of the rhyme correspond to the two murders that have occurred so far. They come to the conclusion that Uenoan, whoever he is, must be on the island somewhere, killing people. A search of the island is decided upon immediately. In light of the island's sparse vegetation, the search takes only a few hours and yields no results. Mr. Bloor is taken aback when Lombard pulls a pistol from his coat pocket and reveals that he has it concealed within his jacket collar. When the men reach a precipice, they realize they'll need a rope to descend to the bottom and look for hidden tunnels. Bloor agrees to go back to the house in order to get one. When General MacArthur is alone and staring off into the water, Vera, who is now all by herself, comes upon him. Delusional and confused, the elderly guy claims that the end is near. They have only a few days left, he tells them. He is, nevertheless, composed and requests privacy. He informs Vera that he is looking forward to his death and that he has been haunted by guilt over the death of his purported victim, Arthur Richmond. Lombard is dropped down the cliffs by Bloor and Armstrong with the help of their rope in order to search for any hidden caverns. He thinks it peculiar that Lombard has a handgun and that he is an unusually good climber, as Bloor notes in his journal. Searches have turned up nothing, Lombard tells the three men so they return to their residence and continue their search. As the house is modern and lacks many places to hide, this search is completed in a short amount of time. In the end, the three men are compelled to conclude that there is no one on the island but themselves and the eight other members of their group. The men get into an argument after they've reached this conclusion. Bloor wants to know why Lombard carries a gun, and demands an explanation. He claims that he was contracted to conduct a work on the island by a man named Isaac Morris who warned him that he would encounter difficulties there. As soon as the bell sounded, lunch was served. Except for General MacArthur, who Armstrong goes to retrieve, everyone gathers in the dining room. Armstrong returns to the room shortly after he has left. However, Vera deduces MacArthur's death before he can finish his sentence. According to Armstrong, MacArthur was slain by a strike to the head. On the table, Vera notes that there are now just seven sculptures left to display. Bloor and Armstrong find MacArthur's body and transport it to his room. Wargrave tells everyone gathered in the drawing room that he has come to the conclusion that someone in the group is responsible for the murder. This conclusion is supported by everyone in the group, except Vera. It is agreed that the group should proceed as if any one of them could be the murderer after a few objections from the women and the more professional guys are voiced. This means that no one in the gang can provide a flawless alibi, and hence, Wargrave urges them to be wary about whoever they put their faith in. Wargrave dismisses the group's concerns, and they break up to discuss them. In the living room, Vera and Lombard discuss their mutual lack of suspicion for one another. Lombard admits that he thinks Wargrave is the killer, and Vera believes that Dr. Armstrong is responsible because he is the only doctor in the room and could fabricate any of the victim's deaths. Wargrave and Armstrong, 
who are standing nearby, also speak. Armstrong is terrified that they will be assassinated that night when they sleep. When Wargrave sees Armstrong, he automatically assumes that the man has a commonplace mind. He claims to know the identity of the assassin despite the fact that he has no proof that would hold up in court. T is served in the drawing room that afternoon. Mr. Rogers bursts into the bathroom and announces that one of the bathroom's silk drapes has been stolen. This rekindles everyone's anxiety, even if no one in the group understands what it means. Locking their doors, the party enjoys its dinner and heads to bed. Mr. Rogers locks the dining room door before he goes to bed to prevent anyone from removing any more of the Indian figurines. Many of the visitors are baffled as to why Mr. Rogers didn't wake them up the following morning when they were expecting him to. Rogers is nowhere to be seen, but Vera discovers that another of the dining room's Indian figurines has gone taken. Rogers' body is found in the woodshed with a hatchet wound to the back of his neck soon after the company arrives. Seven young Indian boys cutting up sticks, one hacked himself in half and then there were six, Vera points out in the fourth verse of the rhyme. When she thinks back to the next stanza, she is slightly hysterical and wonders if or not there are any beehives on the island. Armstrong has to hit her to get her to realize what she's doing before she can stop. Breakfast will be prepared by Emily and Vera. Bloor confides in Lombard while they cook that he believes Emily is the assassin. He also admits that he had a greater role in the offense for which he was being investigated than he had previously admitted. Wargrave advises that the group meet in the drawing room once again once breakfast is finished. A wobbly Emily says she wishes she could stay at the table. A bee buzzing on the window causes Emily to notice that someone is standing behind her. Her reasoning is sluggish and clearly altered by drugs. A sting prickles the back of her neck as she makes the mistaken assumption that the person standing behind her is Beatrice Taylor, the housemaid she accidentally killed earlier. To their horror, they find Emily dead of injection from a hypodermic needle after having discussed the possibility of her being the killer. Guests go to Armstrong's room after he admits to having a needle in his bag and discover that it has vanished. This gives Wargrave the idea to secure all weapons, including Lombard's gun and Armstrong's medical kit, for safekeeping. Finally, Lombard's gun is determined to be missing. They keep Armstrong's medical supplies in a locked chest and then store the locked chest in another location. Lombard receives one key, while Bloor receives the other. There is a chance that a battle may ensue between the two men in order to get both keys, which would draw the attention of other people who might be lurking in the area. In the drawing room, where only Rogers can operate the house's generator, everyone gathers to light candles to keep the room dark. After all, there are only five of them left. To avoid being surrounded, they all agree that only one person will ever leave the group at a time. Vera is the only one in her dorm who is taking a shower by herself. At first she notices a salty aroma and the sensation of wetness on her throat. As the others rush to her aid, they discover that a piece of seaweed has been dangling from the ceiling for some time already. Lombard deduces that the intent was to scare her to death by evoking memories of Cyril's drowning. Vera refuses to drink the alcohol Bloor brings her because she fears he may have poisoned it. When they realize that Wargrave didn't come upstairs with them, the quarrel ends. They discover him seated in his chair with the crimson silk curtain that was gone draped across his chest and a grey judge's wig made from some wool that Emily had dropped on the floor downstairs. The gang remembers the fifth stanza from the rhyme, five young Indian boys going in for law. One got in chancery, dressed like a judge, and then there were four. Wargrave is revealed to have been shot in the head. The body of Wargrave is taken to his room, where the party's surviving four members swiftly have dinner before retiring to their rooms. Despite everyone's belief that they know who the killer is, no one has made an official charge. In Lombard's room, he discovers that his gun has been returned. After Cyril's death, Vera realizes she told him he could swim out to the neighboring rock even though she was aware that it was highly likely he would fail and die. What does Hugo know about it? She wonders. Bloor tries to focus on the cold facts of the case in his room, but he continues thinking about his putative victim, James Landor, and how he framed him. He slips out of his room to check a commotion in the hallway. The front door of the house is open, and a figure darts out of the shadows. Lombard and Vera are awoken by Bloor and find that Dr. Armstrong is missing from his bedroom. Vera is instructed to stay still by the two men as they rush outside to find him. They return soon after, claiming that they had been unsuccessful in their search. A shattered window pane and only three Indian statues remain for the three visitors who remain. Breakfast is served to the Vera, Lombard, and Bloor on this particular morning. Now that the storm that hindered communication with the mainland has subsided, they're evaluating their options for departing the island. 
Armstrong's absence has Vera recalling a passage in the rhyme, four tiny Indian boys went out to sea, a red herring gobbled one, and then there were three. She suggests that possibly Dr. Armstrong isn't dead after all, and that he simply vanished as a ruse to keep them from finding out the truth. The trio spends the morning on the cliffs, seeking in vain to use a mirror to communicate with the mainland. Blore returns to the house after a few hours to get something to eat. Out of fear, he begs Lombard for the gun, but Lombard declines. Lombard informs Vera that he believes Blore is the killer once Blore has gone. Though Armstrong may still be alive, Vera believes the assassin is otherworldly, such as a spirit or an extraterrestrial. Lombard worries that Vera's guilt is causing her to go insane, so he confronts her about what really transpired leading up to Cyril's drowning. Despite Vera's reluctance, they hear a big smash coming from the home and rush over to see what it might be. Upon arriving in Vera's room, they discover Blore's body crushed by a bear-shaped marble clock on the mantel. The rhyme's eighth line, three tiny Indian boys walking in the zoo, a giant bear cuddled one and then there were two, refers to this situation. Vera and Lombard decide to wait for help on the cliffs, believing that Armstrong is still in the house someplace. When they reach the cliffs, they see something on the beach below and decide to climb down to find Armstrong's body. Vera and Lombard suddenly see each other in a new light, without any suspects saving each other from each other. A wolf-like face and sharp teeth catch Vera's attention. Lombard sneers at her when she suggests they move the body out of the way of the incoming tide, but she agrees. Lombard suddenly discovers that his gun is missing as he bends over to move the body, and he turns around to see Vera pointing it at him. He tries to attack her but she shoots him dead with her gun. Vera rushes back to her house, relieved that she has defeated the obvious killer, to try and get some rest until aid arrives. While attempting to recall the final rhyme's final line, she finds three figurines still resting on the dining room table. While referring to Cyril's death as a he got married and then there were none, she is actually referring to Hugo's subsequent marriage to another lady. Suddenly, she gets the distinct impression that Hugo is waiting for her upstairs. Once inside her room, she finds the noose hanging from the same hook in the ceiling that had previously held her seaweed the night before as she climbs the stairs. Weak from shock, she believes Hugo wants her to hang herself because, as the poem's genuine last line states, he went and hung himself and there were none. Vera hangs herself by putting her head through a chair's noose. It finishes with an epilogue in which two investigators debate and retell the case's circumstances. The diaries of several of the guests have been examined and a chronological line of the fatalities has been established. Since the chair she had shoved away to hang herself was carefully put upright against a wall when they got on the island, they know Vera was not the murderer. On the night that the visitors arrived, Isaac Morris, the guy who hired Lombard and Blore, was found dead of an apparent overdose of sleeping pills on the island. After then, the detectives talk about a manuscript that was found by a fisherman and given to the authorities. The manuscript is shown in its entirety in the next section of the book. Author Justice Wargrave states that he has knowledge of the answer to an unsolved crime in his book. I was a vicious and psychopathic child, Wargrave says, and I got my fix by becoming a judge, which allowed me to execute people inside the framework of the law. After several years of this, he says that his urge to kill grew stronger and he longed to carry out the act of death himself. By withholding vital medication from an elderly woman, they allowed her to die a doctor told him one day. For this reason, the doctor was able to exonerate the couple in front of Wargrave. Wargrave's thoughts turned to the amount of killers who go unpunished because their cases cannot be properly understood. After reading up on a few cases, he vowed to carry out a series of murders to punish the guilty. Isaac Morris, a man who had supplied a drug to a young acquaintance of Wargrave's, who later committed himself, was also slain by Wargrave, according to the investigation. As he recounts each murder he has committed, Wargrave emphasizes that he only did it because of his natural sense of right and wrong. Dr. Armstrong was duped into becoming his ally, and he helped him fake his own death by pretending to detect a bullet wound on the man's forehead, according to the doctor's account. Despite the fact that Lombard and Blore had returned Wargrave to his room, he sneaked out and met Armstrong on the rocks. The doctor was killed when he was shoved into the ocean by the assailant. Wargrave claims he had the means to put an end to Vera's life, but instead of doing so, he rigged up a noose in her chamber, hoping she would use it out of her own remorse. He also points out that he was the only one who was not guilty of the crime he was accused of on the first day of the trial, as he was the only one sentenced to death. To wrap up, Wargrave admits to having found out months ago that he was terminally ill. 
To make it appear as though he had been murdered, he went to great measures to orchestrate his own suicide. In order to make it appear as if he had been shot by someone else, he set up the revolver to fire from a distance using a mechanism of his own design. Ten dead bodies and an unsolved situation on Indian Island are the final words uttered by him. Justice Wargrave, a former judge and natural leader, Wargrave has a reputation of being a hanging judge or make judgments that usually lay down a guilty judgment and sentence many individuals to death. Wargrave is a very clever man and a born manipulator. After the first murder, Wargrave takes over as the gang's de facto head. The group trusts him and that makes it simpler for him to kill them off one by one without drawing any suspicion. Wargrave is a troubled man, who takes sadistic satisfaction in murdering but thinks that he is able to uphold a strong sense of justice while doing so. He is definitely mad and is divulged to be terminally ill near the end of the book, resulting in his suicide. Vera Claythorne, Vera is a bit crazy, unstable woman who arrives to Indian Island with the goal of becoming a secretary for a rich guy that lives there. She is trying to escape her past as she is guilty of hastily killing a tiny boy so that the guy she loved would receive his estate. Although she was acquitted of all wrongdoing, Vera's lover Hugo nevertheless left her for another woman. She becomes kind of an audience viewpoint in the story and she is the one to originally bring up the Ten Little Indians poem and remark its connections to the killings. Despite being one of the book's most intelligent characters, Vera's fits of hysteria kill her in the end when she commits suicide due to her guilt-ridden delusion about Hugo's request. Philip Lombard. Lombard arrives to Indian Island to escape a background which is not explained in the novel, but seems to have involved some mercenary soldier work in Africa. Philip is a highly cunning, brilliant man and uses it throughout the novel to attempt to find out who the killer is. He is kept alive longer than nearly any other character in the novel but is slain in the end by Vera with his own revolver. According to Wargrave, Dr. Armstrong is a very gullible individual. The book opens with him being accused of killing a patient on his table, but he subsequently confesses that he killed her by operating on her while intoxicated. Wargrave takes advantage of Armstrong's frail character to enlist his assistance in his mission. Regardless of Armstrong's knowledge of Wargrave's identity, Wargrave pushes him down the cliff. Mr. Blore, a former police detective and current private investigator, Blore is bold to the point of often being foolhardy. He's accused of lying under oath in court because a criminal gang asked him to. A number of characters are suspected of being the murderer by Bloor throughout the story, but Bloor never comes to a conclusion about who it is. Emily Brent, a pious, religious old woman who reads her Bible frequently, Emily Brent was suspected of murdering Beatrice Taylor, a pregnant maid who she fired. When she dies, Emily continues to believe that Beatrice Taylor is going to kill her, unlike the rest of the people in this story. Even to herself, Emily is a God-fearing lady who is so confident in her own innocence that she refuses to acknowledge her guilt. General MacArthur, an old, former army man who is accused of sending a lieutenant that he found to be his wife's lover to his death in World War I. MacArthur has since also lost his wife. When he confesses to the murders, he is so guilt-ridden and fatigued that he retreats to the seaside cliffs to await his own death following the first killings. Anthony Marston Although he is the first to be killed and therefore is only in the book for a short time, Marston makes a big impression. In the media, he's portrayed as a wealthy, attractive, car-obsessed man who's a little psychotic and exhibits no remorse for allegedly murdering two children in a hit-and-run. As the first victim, Wargrave believes that Tony Marston was the least to blame for the group's crime, given that he may not have realized what he was doing was wrong in the first place. Mr. Rogers, the butler of the house. Rogers has never met Mr. Owen and is just following instructions in a letter that was mailed to him, it emerges after individuals start getting slain. Rogers is accused of intentionally failing to provide an elderly patient of a former employer with medication she required, resulting in her death. Even after his wife is found dead in their room, Rogers remains dedicated to his role as a respectable servant. Mrs. Rogers, a frail, weak-nerved woman who faints after the recording is played detailing her crimes. Wargrave suspects that Mrs. Rogers was led into killing her previous employer by her husband and as such chooses to give her the relatively simple death of overdosing on sleeping pills. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video.